Writing tests for your code is difficult, but writing high quality tests is even more difficult. So in this video, I want to talk about different ways that you can write tests to write good, high quality tests relatively easily. Because if you're currently writing your test code the same way you write your application code, I guarantee you it's going to lead to incredibly poorly written tests. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And I'm going to be talking about a lot of different ways you can write your tests that are going to apply to unit tests, integration tests, end to end tests, and so on. And the very first thing I want to talk about actually comes from this blog article, and it's about the golden rule of assertions. And all this fancy terminology really means is that your test should only fail if the code behind them is actually incorrect and broken. There should be no flaky tests that fail sometimes or tests that fail when you change how your code works, even if the code still works perfectly fine. So that's the entire idea behind this article. I'll link it in the description for you to check it out, but I'm going to be going over in depth exactly what this means in this part of the video and then cover some other additional topics later. So let's look at this code real quick. We're going to go to the actual code itself before we look at the test. All we have is a function right here called get person name. You pass it in a person and you pass that person to the person parser and we're telling it we want to get the name. So if we look at that person parser, all it does is it takes in a person object and a property and it gives us that object from the property. And that's super straightforward and easy. Obviously, the code you're testing is most likely going to be significantly more complex than this. So we have here, this is going to take a person object, pass it to the parser, telling it we want the name property, and it's going to give us back the name property. Now, if we look at our test, it's a little bit more complicated, but I'll go through line by line what's happening. First, we're creating a person object for us to be able to test on, rather straightforward. I'm going to skip this line for now because we're going to go to line two, or three, sorry, where we're getting the name of the person by calling get person name, passing it in the person, and we're getting the name. And then again, I'm going to skip down to the very last line where we're expecting that that name is equal to Kyle. That's a relatively straightforward and good test. And actually, if we comment out the lines that I said that we should ignore, our test will still pass and work just fine. As you can see, it's passing down here. Now, if we bring those lines back in, I want to talk about what these are doing. This is using a spy, which essentially is allowing us to look at a function and determine if it's been called, what parameters it's been called with, and so on. So we're looking at the parse function on our person object. That is this function right here. All we're doing is creating a spy so we can check to see, has this thing been called? Then down here, we're expecting that function to have been called with the person object and the name property. And if we look here, you can see that that's exactly what we're doing right here. So we're just testing to make sure that our parser is getting the correct information passed into it. And that's all this portion of our test is doing. So if we save, you can see again, everything's still passing and you probably think this is a pretty good test. But in reality, this test is incredibly brittle and doesn't actually work that great. It'll work great if our test breaks because you know we accidentally pass an age instead of name, you'll see our test immediately fails, which is great. But what happens if we're like, you know what, this person parser really doesn't do anything. I'm going to remove the person parser and just return person.name. This is still going to be a perfectly fine working piece of code. Everything in here works fine. But when I save, you'll notice my test fails. And the reason that my test fails is because we're expecting the parse function to be called, but it never actually gets called. So the problem with this test is that we're testing implementation details of our test. This first line right here of expect name to be Kyle, this is great because we're testing what the actual result of our function is based on specific inputs. This line right here though, on the other hand, is really a bad practice that I see all the time because now we're testing the implementation details of how that function is actually written. And anytime that you write a test, you should almost never care about what the implementation details are. And instead you should try to abstract away everything as if it was a black box. And all you know are the inputs going in and the outputs coming out. Anytime that you mess with testing implementation details or changing implementation details of a function, this makes your test incredibly brittle because anytime those implementation details change, your entire test breaks, even if the code still works, and it just makes your test harder and more complicated to write. So to make this test better, honestly, we just need to remove all of that section related to spying on that function and checking if it was called property and doing that immediately. Now our test is passing. And if it was for some reason having an error because we got the age property instead of the name, we're still able to pick up on that potential problem that is coming in. So this makes our code a lot easier to write in the testing portion, and it makes it much more resilient to change. Now, in that particular example, you probably thought, well, that's really easy. I wouldn't actually test that, but I cannot count the number of times I've looked at code bases in tests that have tons of those calls where it's asking, you know, has this function been called? Has it been called with these properties? And sometimes 
using this particular code is great, especially if you need to pass a function into another function. You need to be able to test, has that function been called? For example, if we had to pass a function into here with some information inside of it, I would need to be able to test, has that function been called? Is it doing the thing it needs to be doing? That's a great use case for this particular implementation detail testing. But that's because we're passing in the function and we want to make sure the thing's working inside that function. And even when you're passing in functions, you don't always need to test to make sure they're called. It's just that's probably about the only time or one of the few use cases where using to have been called with or similar functions are actually useful for your code. But most of the time, if you see this type of thing inside your test, really think long and hard, are you testing the actual implementation details of this code or are you testing to make sure that the code is functioning properly? Those are two different things and you wanna make sure that you separate them when you write your test. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite just as easy as completely ignoring all of the implementation details of a function, because sometimes those implementation details actually impact how you write a test, because they have things going on that you want to ignore. For example, if you're writing a unit test or an integration test, you may not want to deal with network request to a API, or you may not want to deal with database request to a database. So this is where you may want to implement some form of mocking, where instead of calling out to that API or calling out to that database, you're mocking those calls to make them a fake version so that your tests can run more quickly since they don't have to do those extra steps. And also you aren't relying on those services being running for your actual test to pass because really you're trying to test does that function work and you're not caring if the internet connection to your server is working properly. So let's take an example of what that will look like. We'll just say an export function called get person. And we're just going to come in here and we're going to have a fetch request to some type of URL, url.person, whatever. This is just a URL that's going to get you a particular person. And then we want to come in here, dot then, we're going to get a response, convert that to JSON, just like that. And then we're just going to return that information from here. So there we go. Really straightforward, simple get person function. Obviously, it's going to be more complex in a real world app, but just imagine you have some type of fetch request in here that's getting specific data. Well, now if we come in, we wrote a test for that. So we could say test, it gets a person. There we go. We could come in here and we can call that get person function. Make sure it's get person, not get person name. There we go. And maybe we pass in like an ID or something here as well. So we could pass in an ID and then we can put that in as part of our string right here. Really, it doesn't matter what the actual code looks like. So we can come in here and we can pass in some type of ID like 10, doesn't matter. And this should get us a person. And we just need to make sure that we await this function because it is going to be asynchronous code. Then we can just do a simple expect right here. We could say, for example, person.id to be 10. There we go. And this code would work properly if we actually had an internet connection set up and the code running at this particular URL was working and our API was working and all these other if, if, ifs. But you'll notice when I save this, obviously my test is failing because first of all, this isn't even a real URL. And even if it was, there's no server running at that particular URL. And maybe there would be a server running at one point, but currently it's down for unknown reasons that I don't have any control over. So I don't want my test to be flaky and fail like that. So this is a great use case for where you want to mock the internals of a function. I still don't want to test that this fetch is being called properly with certain things. All I want to do is just mock this fetch request. Now there's lots of different ways to mock functions inside of things like vtest or jest or whatever testing framework you're using. But generally, if you want to mock a fetch request or a network request, you're going to want to use a library for that. And the library MSW, Mock Service Worker, is generally the library that I go to when I need to mock out API requests because it makes it really easy to do. And I can do it essentially application wide without having to write it in every single one of my individual tests. Now, this is really good for unit testing and integration testing because I may only want to test this particular unit of my code and nothing else that interferes. But when you're writing an end-to-end -end test, something that's going to test your entire application from the very smallest piece of code all the way to the largest component rendering inside of the DOM, you want to make sure that you actually keep all those database requests and fetch requests and everything in there because those tests are to test that your entire application when put together with everything works as you expect. So if you're writing an end-to-end -end test, I highly recommend keeping the mocking to an absolute minimum. And honestly, you probably shouldn't have any mocking at all. But when you're doing a unit test 
or integration tests, those lower level tests, sometimes in specific scenarios, it makes sense to mock out things like fetch requests that you don't want to have to spend the time waiting for or dealing with them being down when it's not related to your test. You just want to be really careful though, because if you're writing a ton of mocks, especially for things not related to like fetch requests and so on, it becomes very difficult to write your code. And oftentimes if you have too many mocks in your test, you get to the point where your test isn't actually testing the code it's supposed to. And instead it's testing to make sure that all your mocks you set up were correct and that your test is actually correct and not that the code that it's supposed to be testing is correct. This is something I've definitely done myself and ran into before in the wild, where you see code that has 10, 20 different mocks inside of one single test. And at the end of the day, the test really isn't doing anything other than, you know, ensuring that you wrote all these different mocks correctly and not that your actual code is working like you expect it to. So that's kind of the golden rule of your assertions. You want to make sure that they don't actually fail when they shouldn't. So this involves not testing implementation details like we talked about in this first test, and also making sure you don't rely on external things that are out of your control, like APIs or databases, unless you're obviously doing an end-to-end -end test where you should be relying on those things. But another thing you want to make sure is that you don't have tests that fail intermittently. This is one of the most annoying problems to run into when you're writing tests, especially if you're trying to run a test suite that has hundreds or thousands of tests, and then you run it and all of a sudden it fails. And it fails because of one random test. You run it again, oh, it succeeded this time. You run it again, and now a different random test is broken. This is a horrible experience to deal with, which is why if you have tests in your code base that fail sometimes, but don't fail other times, and you don't know why it's happening, and the only thing that makes sense is that the actual test itself is poorly written, just go ahead, find that test, delete it. If you can't fix it, just completely remove it because having a test that fails sometimes and not other times, especially when it's not related to how good your code is and if it's actually working, that's a test that is negatively impacting your code because now when you run your test suite and you see three failures, you may just think, oh yeah, those are the ones that are flaky, whatever. But you don't know if those are the flaky ones or not and it becomes more difficult to deal with. So just remove those flaky tests that fail sometimes and don't fail other times. This will give you more confidence in the fact that if you do have a failure in your test, you know it's for an actual reason that your code is bad, not just because your tests are bad. Now, in order to avoid flaky tests, one of the best things you can do is just write better tests, which is kind of the whole idea behind this video. And one way to do that is to actually do test-driven development. Now, this is definitely not for everyone and not for every specific scenario, but one of the hardest things about writing tests is that you know all the implementation details of the test before you go ahead and write it. That's what happened in this only get the name of the person code, we were testing the individual implementation details of what was going on in that function with this person parser. And that's because I wrote the test after I wrote the function. If you go ahead and you write the test before you write the function, it's pretty much impossible to include implementation details in your testing. And instead you're focused on only testing, okay, given input A, B, and C, my outputs are expected to be X, Y, and Z. It's super easy to do that mapping in your head and write out all the different tests that you think you need before you actually write the function and then write the function and make sure all your tests still work. Now, like I've said, this is definitely not for every specific scenario, but if you're doing like pure functions or writing smaller bits of code, it can be a really great way to make sure that you don't accidentally include implementation details in your code. Now, if you just don't like test-driven development or it's not making sense for your particular piece of code, the other option is when you're writing out the actual test for your code, what you need to do is actually think about what the code is, the actual implementation detail, as a black box. Pretend that you don't know what the code inside of here is. Because honestly, if you're writing a test for code that someone else wrote, it's honestly probably going to be a better test than if you're writing a test for code you wrote because you know exactly what every line of code in that function does, and it starts to implement itself into the test you write. You kind of subconsciously think about that when you're writing the test, and you don't want to think about those implementation details. So to the best of your ability, try to forget everything about what's inside of the function and only think, okay, given these inputs and given these outputs, what should I expect my code to do? Now, another thing that you can do to really drastically improve the quality of your test is to not worry about having dry or non-repeating principles. A lot of people, when you're writing code, you think, okay, I don't want to repeat myself. That's what dry stands for. And I want to make sure that my code is as abstract and extendable as possible. But when you're writing tests, you really want each individual test that you write to stand on its own. If you have a lot of code that's shared between your different tests, it could become really tricky because now to change one test, you need to go change the setup code that affects all your tests. And now maybe it breaks another test. So generally it's okay to repeat yourself a bunch of times. For example, if I wanted to write two tests related to getting the name of this person, 
Well, I could come down here, I could copy this test down, and let's say this one was testing something slightly different. It's gonna be essentially the same code, but let's say the expect statement down here was different. It was getting something else from the person and doing something slightly different. Like maybe we wanna test what happens when the person doesn't have a name. And we'll see here that this should be undefined. There we go. So this should still work and you can see it is properly working. So this is testing multiple different edge cases of this particular thing. Well, one thing that people will try to do, especially if the person was supposed to have a name here, like their name was still Kyle, but we were testing something else, is they'll go ahead and say, you know what, this line and this line are exactly the same. I'm just going to, you know, go ahead, copy this line, move it out here. And now, boom, I got the same person I can use for both my tests. And you know what, if I want to update something inside that person, it's going to be just perfectly fine and going to work. Obviously, this leads to problems because, like I said, what happens if I want to test when the person has no name? Or what happens when I want to test if they have a completely different name? Or what if I want to test if they have no age? Or what if I want to test that they have a brand new property applied to them? Obviously, I can't do any of these things when I abstract this information out. So in almost every single scenario when I'm writing tests, I like to keep each individual thing inside of the test that I'm doing and just keep all of them as self-contained units and don't think about my other tests or the code inside of them when I'm writing them. It's okay if you repeat large chunks of code. Even if 90% of the entire test is just repeated code between each and every one of your tests, that's generally an okay thing because now if you move that out into a setup function and then later want to add more tests, now you have multiple places where you need to change code to change those tests. And if you change the setup function, it's going to affect all of your tests, which is generally not a good thing. Now, there are specific scenarios where having a setup section is fine, especially if you need to do the exact same thing, no matter what, for a bunch of different tests. Like if you're rendering out a React component to be able to test that React component, you probably need to render that component in every single test. So having a helper function or a setup script that does that makes a lot of sense. And a lot of testing libraries have things like before all or before each to run specific bits of code before or after each one of your different tests are running for those specific scenarios. But if you see that you're using these before or after each functions a lot inside of your code base, you may want to rethink, is this actually something that's helping my test or am I trying to abstract things out because that's how I'm used to writing code, which in the end just makes your test harder to actually write and maintain. Honestly, this was the hardest thing for me to overcome when I was writing tests and still something I struggle with to this day because it's really tempting to say, okay, I've repeated myself so much in these tests, I want to abstract it out. But trust me, if you abstract it, it's just going to make your life more difficult and it's going to make your test harder to maintain. Now, the final topic I want to talk about has to do with integration, unit tests, and end-to-end -end tests, and how much of each one you should write, when you should write them, and so on. In my personal opinion, and the opinion of quite a lot of people out there, writing more end-to-end -end tests and more integration tests is generally going to give you a better idea of if your application actually works versus having more unit tests. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the differences between these three, I have a full video covering them. I'll link it in the cards and description for you. But essentially, an end-to-end -end test tests your entire application. It tests your database, your authentication. It tests to make sure things render on the page. It actually brings up a full browser version of your application and tests your application like a user. It uses a mouse to click a button. It uses a keyboard to fill in inputs. Everything is done just like your user would interact with your web page. And these tests are the most difficult to write because you have all of these working parts that need to go together and you have to do a lot of things to make sure your test is run because generally you're testing larger portions of your application. It's not going to be a three line test like this really simple and easy test here, which is a unit test. Now, an integration test is essentially just testing to make sure different parts of your application work well together. So maybe that three or four different functions can communicate together across different things. And a unit test is generally testing one single unit. Usually it's going to be like a single function of your code. Now, as I mentioned, you generally want to have as many end-to-end -end tests as possible. That's because these are going to cover the largest amount of your code base. So you can write one end-to-end -end test and it's going to cover 50, 100, 1,000 different functions in your code base. Obviously, it's not going to test them completely in every specific scenario, but it's going to give you a good idea of if the entire workflow of your application is working. And it also works the most like a user. So at least it gives you confidence that your test and your code is going to work well when a user interacts with it. Now, unit test and integration test, I generally find that these are really useful for testing like core business logic inside your code base, especially if you have like a peer function, that's the perfect use case for a unit test because it's incredibly easy to test that particular piece of logic. But you don't need nearly as many of these as you think. You may be tempted to write tons of unit tests because it's really easy to write a unit test. It takes almost no time. And it seems like you're able to test things, you know, essentially to 100% perfection. 
but you don't actually need that except for on the more core pieces of your business logic. And you'd be better off spending the time it takes to write 10 unit tests, generally just writing one end-to-end -end test to cover that exact same scenario. Now, obviously it's important to have a good balance of all these different test types. And I find that starting by testing the most business critical logic inside your application is the best and write some unit tests for those peer functions that you're doing inside of there, write some integration tests for things that are a little bit more complicated and using multiple pieces, and then write an end-to-end -end test to make sure everything works really well with the whole flow of your user. And maybe even write a couple of them for like a failure state and a success state. Now that's a ton of stuff about testing, but that's really just scratching the surface because there's so much more you can do with testing. And if you really wanna master testing and literally everything else there is to learn about JavaScript, I highly recommend checking out my JavaScript simplified course. I have an entire section that goes super in depth into testing and shows you exactly how to set everything up and write good quality tests. And I also covered literally everything else you need to know about JavaScript from the absolute basics, all the way to things like security, clean code practices, and so much more. If you're interested in that, it's linked down in the description below. And with that said, have a good day.